Hey. What you doing? Oh, just reading. Reading what? Uh, my Hebrew Bible. <laughs> That's such a pastor's thing to say. What do you mean? Well, you know, it's only pastors who are into that nerdy stuff because, well, they're pastors, right? Hebrew and Greek are for pastors. It says who? Uh-huh. Who says Greek and Hebrew are just for pastors? Well, I mean, it, it kind of just makes sense, right? You're the only people who would need it. I mean, I get maybe seminary professors as well. And why would we be the only people who need it? Well, because you preach and teach. The, the average Christian doesn't have a use for that sort of stuff. And so you're telling me that the ability to dig into your Bible deeper is something only pastors and teachers should do? Uh, when did I say that? Well, if Greek and Hebrew are only useful for pastors, and they're a tool to dig deeper into the Word, then that's what you're saying. Well, I... And if that's the case, then I suppose the average Christian shouldn't study doctrine and theology. And I mean, hey, while we're at it, why study the Bible to begin with when your pastor can just tell you what it means, right? No... Oh wait, the church did that for a couple hundred years. Isn't that one of the major reasons that started the pre-Reformation and the Reformation era? Yeah... My point is, to say that Hebrew and Greek is only for pastors is dangerous. I mean, just think about it practically. If I say in a sermon, the Hebrew says this, so the text means that, who's checking me on that? It's not the other pastors, it should ideally be the people in your congregation. So it's important for more than just pastors to know these things. Alright, alright, I get your point. And even the argument that it isn't feasible for the average person to learn isn't really a good argument. I mean, have you ever tried? Sure, it's difficult, it's hard, it takes time, but it is feasible. Okay, 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 okay. I misspoke. Alright, alright. And if you don't get it fully, just watch this video. What video? For those of you that know me, you'll know that I'm passionate about biblical languages. I love them. I read both Hebrew and Greek quite frequently. Currently, I'm working through the Minor Prophets in Hebrew and the Pauline Epistles in Greek. I'm doing my Masters in Biblical Languages. On my bookshelf, I have two rows of books just dedicated to languages. That does not include all the online resources that I have for languages, which if they were physical books, would take up more than a bookshelf itself. My point is, I love biblical languages. But I understand that I'm a little bit unique in this. And for most Christians, while many may appreciate the biblical languages, have no real desire to learn them themselves. And in many cases, that's fine. But as you heard in the intro, what I don't think is fine is the concept that biblical languages are only important for pastors and teachers at Bible colleges and seminaries. On the contrary, it is important for the average person in the church to know biblical languages. There's often a few questions that people have regarding biblical languages. One of them is the use that they would have for it in their daily lives. For some, just reading the Bible and, and studying aspects of it in the English is merely enough. Another question that's often raised is, is it feasible? Is this something that the average person can learn? If I'm being honest, I've talked to a lot of people and when they hear my passion and they hear what I'm doing my masters in, a frequent, a, a very frequent response is, oh, I, I'm not somebody who could do languages. I'm just not a language oriented person. I could never learn another language. It's, it's amazing how many people I actually hear say this. And I'll admit, languages come easier for some people than other people. But I can tell you this, for both people, it always takes work. Perhaps another question that is asked is how much more does it actually bring to the text when reading it in Hebrew or Greek? And for this video, we're specifically focusing on Hebrew. And so in that regard, how much does knowing Hebrew and reading the Bible in Hebrew affect how you read the Bible compared to English? And without giving spoilers, kind of a spoiler, 
it's a lot. It opens up the text in so many new ways. How does it do that? Well, to answer these questions, and to get into reasons, clarification, some good examples, while I was speaking at a Bible college, I interviewed the person who taught me both Hebrew and Greek. Her name is Amy Hancock. She's the librarian and a language teacher at the college. And she is very skilled and very knowledgeable about the languages and has been teaching them for many, many years. This is to a whole range of types of students. And so she has a good grasp of what the language is, what the benefits of the language are, and if it is indeed feasible for the average Christian to learn them. Check this out. So yeah, you, uh, you taught me both Greek and Hebrew. Um, I did what, two semesters of Greek with you? Because I only I was only here for that last year with grammar. Okay. And then, what was it, five with Greek? Yeah, quite Not a few. Not with Greek, <laughs> with Hebrew. With Hebrew, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, why is it important for the average person to learn Hebrew? I think um, the most important thing that stands out to me is that God revealed himself through his word. Um, and he did so in Greek and Hebrew, and so something is always lost in translation. We obviously are so um, privileged to have so many good English translations, and yet what a what a benefit to be able to read the scriptures um, as God revealed Himself in Greek and Hebrew. So then, along with that, well, what about the people who yeah do make that claim? Well, why why do lay people need to learn? Shouldn't that just be the job of the pastor? Well, I think it is very important for a pastor to be able to read the scriptures. Um, for the people of the church to to know God as He revealed Himself, we need we need people in the church who can read um, to be able to study scripture in Hebrew. Um, just the just the time it takes, the personal um, benefit from paying attention to the details. I think um, that shows up in Hebrew that you don't necessarily notice in English, but also it gives lay people confidence in the scriptures. Um, when So often when false doctrine creeps into the church, um, it doesn't just impact the pastor, it impacts you and the people that you work with or the people that you encounter. And so to be able to know uh, what the scriptures say, to be able to read the scripture in Hebrew and in Greek, um, it protects the church. Certainly, Hebrew doesn't always give you the answers, but it certainly narrows down what couldn't be true in a lot of cases. Um, and I think that's great importance for the people of the church. So is Hebrew something that an average person can um, can learn to read it, or is that something that well, you need to have this big intelligence and that to learn it? I might not be... Um consistent with everyone else's thinking on this, but I think Hebrew is a lot easier than Greek. There's a huge amount of resources available, especially online, but also in terms of connecting with other believers in your, um, in your area. Um, the resources available for learning are just certainly an advantage that um, just the availability. I, yeah, it takes time and commitment, I think, are the things, but it certainly is possible for people to learn Hebrew. Yeah, and there are full-length courses um, on mm. YouTube. Yes. Um, I even know there's there's one member in my church who he learned Hebrew by going to the synagogue, and they uh, they taught him Hebrew by uh, teaching him songs and prayers. That's awesome. And so <laughs> it, there are different ways that you can learn it that is definitely feasible. Yeah. So if it is something that an average person can do, and something that that would greatly benefit them. What are some of these um, benefits about learning Hebrew? Like, what's one of the, what are some of the best things about learning the language? I think uh, one of the best things about learning the language is the benefit to hermeneutics, to being able to read the scriptures. Um, often, the questions that I have of the text are not the questions the text is asking, and I think English sometimes sets you up to ask the wrong questions. Um, one example that came to mind here is in. Hebrew grammar. Lately we've been reading through Genesis, so we are presently reading about Noah, and the, the word ark shows up many, many times. In English, my mind jumps to the ark of the covenant, or the ark of the testimony, 
But that's not a connection in Hebrew. The two words are not linked. But in Hebrew, uh, the only other place the word ark is used is in Exodus chapter 2 with regard to Moses. Moses is put into an ark. Um, It's the ark that preserves his life in the midst of um, the judgment that's being inflicted by Pharaoh. Um, And so to be able to connect those two stories through the language of the text, to begin to put together uh, the storyline of salvation and judgment and um, God's act of preserving a people for himself. I think it's the connections that the text makes that put stories together um, that I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily be connecting immediately in English. Not that I couldn't connect those two stories, but uh, the Hebrew certainly leads a person to ask different questions um, and to read differently than the English. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a really good example. I, uh, for my seminary class um, on the Pentateuch, uh, the teacher of it wrote a book that he called An Ark on the Nile. And it's basically, it's a, it's a somewhat of a short commentary on the first two chapters, but one of his major points in it, and the focus of, of it is, you have this word, Ark, used of Noah, the same word is used for Moses. The only time that they're used mm-hmm. in the Old Testament, what is the connection here? And then how does that take you to the Red Sea yeah. and the patterning of that and the sanctuary and salvation? And that's something you don't get out of English because like like what you said, you see the word ark in Genesis, you see the word ark in Exodus, but yeah. you're you're drawn to the Ark of the Covenant, not necessarily the Ark of the basket that yeah. Moses was in. But we, it, like I know I drew, drew that as like, is there a connection between these arcs? Well, I don't But when you look yeah. in the look in the Hebrew and you see these different words. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's that's one great example. Um is there another example of something that somebody can get out of the Hebrew that you can't get from the English? Um, another example that came to my mind was in Psalm 1. So Psalms 1 and 2 are setting up the whole book of Psalms. Um, and in Psalm 1, um, immediately you have uh, the man the, who is meditating by day and by ne- night on the Torah. Um, and then as you move into chapter 2, um, in, you have the same word showing up in English. Uh, I wrote down what the English word they used here was. Um, so in English it says, Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The peoples are devising a vain thing. So in Hebrew they're meditating. It's the same word that showed up in chapter 1. Um, just creating that stark contrast between the righteous and the wicked. Um, but certainly it's not as clear in English when you change the word from meditating to devising. I think it's a good translation. It communicates very clearly. Um, but it's not its not bringing your mind back to chapter 1. It's not raising the right questions about the comparison or the contrast that's, um, that's showing up. And I think that happens a lot. Um, in scripture that the best word in English might not be the same word because it's a new context but because it's a new word that communicates well in that context it doesn't take you back uh, nearly as quickly to the previous context. Yeah you lose those parallels. Mm -hmm. Yeah a example um, of that it reminds me it's it's in the book that you and Mr. Armstrong wrote um, when it's talking about how God's going to use the hardness of Pharaoh's heart and the two words there that are used in the Hebrew are punned with Moses earlier. But then if you actually go back to the Joseph narrative, it's punned in what God does to Egypt with the famine. Yeah. It's like all these parallels, but the word is, is translated, the two words are translated, I think, in, in five or six different ways. Yeah. You, you can't see that in English, but when you read in the Hebrew, it's, it's, very, it's very obvious that it's there. Yeah, and the English translations are good. It's not that they aren't, but they're not bringing the connections. And it's the connections, I think, that really enable a person to read scripture and to see the overarching picture of what God is doing. So then would you recommend that people learn Hebrew? Absolutely. I think there's huge benefit to being able to read the scriptures in Hebrew. And I would caution against just learning enough Hebrew to define a word or to, um, yeah, to parse a word, to be able to say grammatical information about it. Um, because Really, it's once you can read, once you can put together, uh, see the connections that scripture is making. But also it communicates, um, I think, to a greater degree um, 
the thinking or the logic of the scriptures. I think it comes through very well in Hebrew, and so I would absolutely encourage every believer who has the opportunity to learn Hebrew. And it's fun. It's a lot of fun. It's hard. Once you get past the difficult part, though, then it becomes a lot of fun. I think the alphabet and the vocabulary is probably the hardest part of Hebrew. Once you can get that kind of figured out, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, getting past the, the different look and sound. And it's nothing like English, so there's so many benefits just from communicating differently. All right, thank you. Yes. So there you had it. You've heard the interview, you've heard her answers in our discussion. Not only is it feasible for the average Christian to learn Hebrew, it would also impact their daily reading and how they study the Bible in a great way. Those who have studied languages can tell you this. When you go from one language to another, you will always, always lose something. Every time. There is never a one-to-one -one equivalent throughout the entire language. The word may mean one thing in this language and have an equivalent term in the other language. An example of this is the Hebrew word ra. It's quite often in English translated evil, but at the same time, in other passages, depending on the context, it's translated misery, harm, calamity. But all these English definitions are to define this one word, depending on its context. This is known as semantic range. This is important because as Amy was saying in a couple of the examples, these are all good translations. But if we don't recognize that all of these are coming from one word, you do lose something in the text. Without this understanding of semantic range as well, you can run into the problems where this word ra is attributed to God. In the sense that God caused a calamity or harm. It's not saying God is evil. It's just one aspect where the Hebrew text opens things up in a way that we don't perceive in the English. In the English, we often do not see all the puns that are taking place in the Hebrew because the Hebrew will be using one or two words, but they're translated so many different ways in English because the context is pushing that semantic range in different directions. Now I could go on all day about these things because, well, I'm passionate about it. But the point is, the original languages open up the Bible in a way that the English and other languages often won't. And a very important point that Amy made about this is the text is often asking a different question than we are asking. The English can be a little bit more ambiguous as to what the question is, whereas the Hebrew is pretty clear. This is also true vice versa. The Hebrew can be very ambiguous, but the English will have to go in only one direction. And so once you can see these in the original language, I know for me personally, it opens up a whole nother avenue of passion and depth to the text that I never saw in English. So what's the point of this video? Well, ultimately, it's to show you the importance of biblical languages, not just for pastors and teachers, but also for the average person in the church. Now, I am by no means saying that every Christian should learn these languages, although that would be pretty cool. But if you've ever wondered about it and thought, no, it's out of my reach, then this video is for you. Yes, it takes a lot of work. And for some, it takes a lot more than others. That's true, nobody's denying that. But there are a ton of resources out there to teach you to go at your own pace for you to be able to learn these languages. There's a difference between difficult and feasible. Languages, yes, are feasible, but they are also difficult. If you'd be interested in learning Hebrew or even Greek, I'll have a couple of links in the description to some courses on YouTube. If you want more information in a more targeted direction, send me an email. Get into contact with me somehow. Links again in the description. A special thanks to Amy for allowing me to interview her. I know you were encouraged and learned much by what she said. And that's all for today. So until next time, remember to know the word, do the word, and share the word. But as always, we do it in love.